Sure. Well, I am, I am glad uh, to see you today. And I look out and I see some of you with name tags. And uh, that is, uh, some of you walked in today and said, wait a minute, because we do name tags in November. The whole month of November, if you haven't been part of our family for very long, uh, we do a whole month of name tags in the month of November. And it happened when we moved into this building about nine and a half years ago, and we realized there were so many people and uh, different services, and it's much more spread out, and this side of the church doesn't always know everybody on this side of the church and vice versa. And we thought, let's just help people out, and we put name tags out. We actually have our own monogram name tags. These are some of our old ones with our old logo on it. We actually have new ones with the new logo. Pastor Brian said, let's use those old ones up, and uh, we'll be ready for the new ones for, for name tag November. But this is, you've heard of Christmas in July, right? This is name tag November in July. And just for today, so um, we're starting a new sermon series today, but before I get there, I just wanna say, uh, as far as the Isaacs concert, that's coming up in less than two weeks. Listen, there are plenty of room, and this is an amazing opportunity that we have to bring a group of the quality and caliber that they are. It will be a night of ministry. It's not, I mean, if, if Southern Gospel music isn't your thing, listen, they have incredible harmony. We showed a few of their clips, and I know that you'll be blessed not just by the music, but by the ministry. And so it'll be worth the ticket. We've got them here. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. If you know people in other churches, let them know. Get the word out. Less than two weeks, $20 for that concert is a, is a great deal. Uh, if if you've been like just saying, I, I don't feel comfortable getting online and ordering a ticket that way, stop by at the table out here. We can get you a paper ticket, a paper ticket. We're going old school. So yeah, so if that's your, the way you like it, then, then stop by and get it. But whatever, Let the, get the message out, share. Pastor Weaver has a post on Facebook. You get on and share that and let people know. And I would encourage you tonight to make it a point to come. So thank you for many of you who invested to help students raise money and other people raise money to go to El Salvador. Uh, so many, many of you have given to uh, our camp scholarship fund to help students go to camp. Thank you, bless you for doing that. So tonight is an opportunity for you to see the return on your investment, so to speak. So I would encourage you to come back tonight, be here uh, to support our youth, to encourage them. This is what being part of a church and a body is, is that we encourage and support and, and, uh, and, and build each other up. And so I think that nothing greater that you could do. And you hear testimonies of miracles and of healings and things like that. It's always a good day when you can hear those kind of testimonies. So I encourage you to be back tonight. But uh, let, me, let me just make a comment about the name tags. We're starting a new series, sermon series for the next few weeks called We Are New Hope. Several years ago, we did a, a sermon series called This Is Us, and it, we were just talking about the core values that make New Hope who we are. And so we're getting ready to uh, experience some big changes. We've got an addition over here, if, if you weren't aware of that, that's been going up for the last few months, and we're getting very, very close to being able to move into that space and occupy that area, and uh, there is a state-of-the-art kids area, secure area, so if you've got elementary age kids, you will check them into that area, and it is, so it's secure. You don't have to worry about someone walking down a hall, walking in a room, doing anything. Uh, we, we've got a team that, is, uh, that does security anyway, but this was extra secure. There's a play gym in there. There's, I mean, there is incredible, it's an incredible space, and I can't wait for you to see it. Um, but. Here's what we know just from experience 10 years ago moving over to this facility. We were so excited to have, have space and have room. I don't know if you were here 10 years ago in our old building and it just got to, be, it's not an old building, in our old sanctuary, in our former sanctuary, it was now the auditorium. Sorry about that. I'm talking strange, I don't know what I'm even saying. But before we moved here, we, we were so tight. We were constantly pressing people in, not one seat was available. And we got to the point where people didn't have seats and, and left or they stood. And after church, the, the lobby was so small that we were like literally shuffling like this to get out the door. And there's two doors. You'd either uh, had to go to one door where I was at the door or Pastor Weaver was at the other door. And you literally could not get out without shaking our hands. We loved that. We were so excited to move into this new space and it was phenomenal. But we, we, there were some challenges because we went from having two doors to now five doors. 
and it wasn't quite so easy. We had a lot of space. This lobby is bigger than the sanctuary over there was. So uh, more room, and uh, we're, we're thankful for that. And this affords us some more room. But we know that moving in a, in a, in a new step in that direction with new spaces and all that, we know that it's a challenge when we moved here. It was a little bit of a grieving thing, to be honest with you, because the, the routines changed a little bit. But here's what we know. There are core values that make us who we are. And if we identify and know those values, and the thing is, is they don't have to change. We didn't change who we were when we moved into this building. We, we are the same people. I remember our very first service in this sanctuary was Christmas Eve. And Pastor Weaver had been known to, um, a couple of times, to make a running leap off the platform where the youth were sitting in a section right here and just bah! right in front of them, like startled them. He did that a, more than once, probably two or three times. And so at that Christmas Eve service, it, wasn't, it didn't really fit, but he was trying to demonstrate to people in our first time being in, in this sanctuary that we're the same people. He took a flying leap off of the platform over here and, and nearly injured himself. <laughs> all, to, all to say, we're the same people. And so moving forward, we know that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we don't have to change. We don't have to change who we are. We might be uh, inhabiting some new spaces, and it might change the flow just a little bit, but we're still the same. And so we're gonna take some time to go back and visit through who we are as a church. We are New Hope. This morning I, I'm sharing a message called We Are Relational. We've been a relational church. We've always been, and we want to continue to be a relational church. And that's the idea for having name tags today. We want you to be able to relate to each other. So I want to ask you to do something with me. I want to ask all of you to stand. And we're going to do the most spiritual thing that we'll do all day. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the next couple of minutes, and I want you to find somebody that you don't know, Here's, at, at the very least, I want you to find somebody that's not your spouse or someone in your family. You might have to step across the aisle. Find someone, and I want you to have a two-minute conversation with them. And if you say, well, I don't know what to ask them, I've even given you questions. How long have you attended New Hope? Some of you might say, this is my very first Sunday. Some might say, I've been here 32 years and anything in between. But I want you to take the next two minutes, find somebody that's not your spouse, not in your family, and maybe you just turn and find someone behind you, but I want you to take the next two minutes and get to know somebody new. If you're joining online, I, just hang with us for a minute. We're getting everybody mixed in here, and it's really noisy in the room. But uh, we want to say how much we love you. Thank you for being here today. We're going to give it a couple minutes for people just to visit a little bit. They've got some, some music playing in the background just to kind of facilitate that. But uh, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. All right, more than a minute's gone, so you need to, if you've been doing all the talking, let the other person do some talking and find out who you are. Take a minute, a minute more, and then we're going to wrap it up. All right, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, wrap it up. Land the plane, so to speak. Okay, when you're done talking, you can sit down. I'm calling time. Hello? Are y'all paying attention? Hey, I'm up here. You're taking my time. You're taking it a little too far. I called time a long time ago. All right, hey, that's awesome, that's awesome. 
thank you for, for, for joining me in that exercise. How many of you met somebody new that you'd never met before? Look at all the hands, look at that. Hey, you may have made a friend today that you will carry for the rest of your life. You may have connected with somebody that you, now, I mean, you've got a new friend and every time you come to church and you see them, you say hi. And if you don't remember their name, okay, some of you may not remember the name, you ask them, hey, tell me, I know we talked that day Pastor Jeff had us sharing it in the, in the middle of the service and I can't remember your name. That's how you do relationships. If you can't remember, I asked somebody today their name and I've asked them three other times. That's embarrassing for me. But here's the thing, I would rather ask and know who they are than to say, ah, it's my, you know, my memory. That's how we do relationship together. So today we're doing this series, we are relational. We have been a relational church. What, is, what does it mean that we're relational? What it means that we as New Hope are a relational church. We want to know you as pastors. So here's the thing, I look across the room and I, I, know, I know 95% of you. There's some people in the room that I've, I've not seen you before. You might be your first time, or maybe I've asked you three times and I can't remember your name. But uh, there are newer people in the room, and uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. But we want to know people. And so it's our, our job. We make it a point to try to get to know people, and not just by face and recognition. That's the, that's the beginning, but to really know people. And we want you to know us. We want you to know who we are. And, and to say that we're relational, we're accessible. So you hear this, if you're part of New Hope, you hear this all the time. Our phone numbers are available for you to call. My cell phone, I'm not gonna give it to you right now because there's people watching on the camera and I don't know who those people are. <laughs> Next thing you know, my phone number's on the internet. No, but you, my, my card's right out there and uh, you can pick that up, but it, if you don't find the pastor that you need, you call any of us, we'll get you their phone number. You call our office, you can get their phone number and you can call us because we, we care, we want to hear from you, and so we want to be available. Um, you'll find pastors at the door today when you leave, and that's, that's something that we value. I have been to a lot of churches when we travel and I'm on vacation. I try to catch as many church services in that place that, where I, wherever I visit as I can. So on a Saturday, Sunday, I might load up on two or three church services. I just, that's something I like to do. My family gets a little annoyed at me uh, sometimes, but, but they found that that's fun too. But I'll go to a church and I, honestly, most of the churches that I've visited and uh, as I walk out the door, there's nobody greeting me. No pastor, not even, no, nobody. And so we value that. I mean, I, what, I, what, I, what I get frustrated is I can't say hi to everybody, but uh, I, I definitely, we all want to meet you, know you. If you're new today, new families especially, please stop and say hi, introduce yourself. We want to know you, and we want people to know each other. That's, that's being relational. That we would take time to, to, to really do an exercise in the middle of a sermon when, when you're taking my preaching time and I give you time just to have a conversation with each other. But I believe that probably is one of the most spiritual things that we could do. Here's, here's the thing, in, in, in the eight o'clock service, Louise uh, Stromberg sits in a certain seat and one day a man named Dennis walked in and sat in her seat. She could have been irritated by that. But you know what she did? She said, I usually sit here, do you mind if I step across? And she sat by him, and they have built the, one of the greatest friendships. And Dennis has, re, has looked after her and cared for her from that day on, and I'm just so thankful for that. Tony and Jenny, um, when they, they sat in the row that they're in, and, uh, and I know Ferg, is, is, he, he stepped out, but they sat in that row and they sat in the same row with Ferg Taylor and uh, for the longest time, you know I had, I had uh, Tony say to me, I can't remember that guy's name, and I had Ferg saying, what was that couple's name that sits on the other end of me? But they have built a, a great friendship just, been the, just by being together and getting to know each other. And there is value in relationships and we want to maintain that as we move forward. And so we're talking about these core values. What do we value as a church? Not only are we relational, we're multi-generational. We believe in that we're bible centered where the bible is the center of everything that we do we have classes we have groups study groups those types of things missions you've heard that missions is our heartbeat we we love missionaries and we love to support missions and we love going in missions and serving one another reaching and making disciples being generous all those things are values that make us who we are and we we're not changing 
this is who we are and this is who we're going to be as we move forward. And so uh, we're going to take some time at the end and I don't have much time. I've got actually 11 minutes to preach to you. But that was my choice to take the time to do that and explain why we're doing that. But at the end, we're going to take some time just to, just to exercise relational ministry. And if you've got a need, I don't know what that might be of any kind, whether it's relational, financial, you need some healing or whatever, we're going to take time to pray for those needs at the end. Centuries ago in Europe, a wealthy philanthropist decided to build a church building for the mountain village that he'd grown up in. Everybody in that village was so excited, but no one was permitted to see the plans, and no one was allowed to to go into the building until it was finished. And finally that day arrived, and the people gathered on that Sunday to, to go in and marvel at the beauty of this new building. But when they went inside, the first thing that was said is, hey, where are all the lamps? This was centuries ago. It's dark in here, where are the lamps? And the philanthropist pointed to a line of brackets along the walls and he gave each family a lamp, telling them, bring your lamps each time that you come to church to worship. And he explained, each time you're here, the place where where you will be seated will have light. But every time that you're not here, your place will will be dark. This is to remind you that whenever you fail to gather with the church, some part of the building will be dark. Wouldn't that be quite the thing for us that when we aren't here, there's a dark spot in the church? And here's what I'm gonna say to that. Every single one of you matters. Everyone matters. And when you're not here, the dynamics change. And you say, well, just me and you know, my little family. Yes, it's different when you're not here. And I'm just gonna point out the significance today. There's somebody that you wouldn't have met and there's somebody that wouldn't have met you. And you may not know, but there is a conversation that is waiting to happen even next week when you're here, that if you're not here, you miss it. You might miss an opportunity to have, to have a, a life-changing encounter, not just by somebody else, but with God in his presence. And I know that church attendance has become one of those things that you know, we can get pretty lax in doing so. And I, I want to commend, you're, you're, you're great at that. But the, I'm just saying the average attendance of a regular attending a regular attender to church these days is 18 times a year. That's what qualifies you. That's one out of three Sundays. That's unfortunate. This is a, this is a place that we need. And listen, as Pastor Zach said earlier, the, the church just isn't a building, a place that we go. The church is people. We're the church. It's not a place to go. It's a place to belong. And we value that. We value the relationships. There's something significant missing when Christians don't gather together. And we found that going through COVID. For 10 weeks here, we didn't meet. And then for weeks and months and years later, we're two years past that time. Here we are, and we haven't fully really recovered because there are people who still haven't made it back. We had some people in the last service that was their first time back. But here's the deal. It's had such a profound effect. And here's what the enemy knows. He knows that if he can disconnect and discourage and disrupt your life and, and you moving forward in, in your God-given calling and the plans and purposes for your life, he's gonna do that. And so that, that has wreaked havoc, but we have to fight to say we're the church, and it's not just church has become too often in our world. The, 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 the usual type church is, is a sermon and a, and a set of songs. And it's become one of these things where church in a lot of places is we, we, we show up, we shake some hands, we sing, we sit, we listen, and we leave. And then we come back next week and do it all over again. But listen, church is so much more than a sermon and a song. It's about relationships, and we value that. We want to know each other. We want you to know each other. We want to know you, and we value this, and this is who we are moving forward. It's all about people connecting in relationship with God and with others. Listen to what Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Some versions say, let us consider how we may encourage or let us consider how we may stir up or spur one another on to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We need each other and we need this. We need the fellowship. We need the encouragement. We need the word. We need, we need all that God has for us. And if we're not here, what are we doing? We're missing out. 
we all the more so. I believe that Jesus has returned. He promised it in his word. He promised that he was going to return. And I believe that that return is very, very near. I believe it. Just look at the things that are going on in our world. And if it's not that near, we're getting nearer all the time. And so as we get to that place, we need to be here to encourage one another. Hey, stay the course. Don't give up. There's so much pressure to give up, tap out, sit down, and, and get out of the race. But we need the encouragement and the support of each other to say, hey, we're in this together. We're part of a family. We're part of a body. We're not just an island to ourselves. We don't just show up and do church. We are the church. We're not just here to watch what goes on. But by the way, that, that choir number this morning, phenomenal. Phenomenal. You would have missed that. And it's not the same watching it online, although I'm glad for people that are online to be able to see that. Uh, but it's just not the same. I don't want to do church as usual. Francis Chan said it's no secret that most people who attend church services come as consumers rather than servants. Our Christian lives are meant to be shared, to, not to live in isolation and separation. We're to share our lives. The Bible calls it fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia. It's about relationships, about doing life together. No one will ever grow to spiritual maturity by just attending church and being a passive observer. No one will ever grow to spiritual maturity by just showing up to church and being a passive observer. Participation in the life of the church is what helps make us healthy and grow. One Jewish religious expert asked Jesus this question. He said, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Which of the commandments is the, uh, is the, is the most important of the commandments of the law of Moses? And this is what Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. He replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. So the Bible ranks healthy relationships as the most important thing. What's the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is very much like that, love your neighbor as yourself. So relationships matter. God is of first importance. If, if we're gonna have healthy relationships and with uh, other people being second. And we talk a lot about recently this culture of joy, putting Jesus first. Jesus first in everything that we do. Jesus first and primary in your life. Let him have that prominence in your life that nothing else matters as much as Jesus. And when we put him in his rightful place, listen, all of our personal uh, relationships, our horizontal relationships with family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, uh, church body, all that kind of falls into place. When we have God in his rightful place, when Jesus is Lord of our lives, then those relationships just happen. Joy comes from Jesus first, others second, and then you uh, falling in line after that. I want to give you an assignment because I don't have time. I'm running out of time quickly. Ephesians chapter four. Would you read that this week talking about the gifts that God has given the church? He talks about uh, pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles, and we all have a place, but we all we all are part of that. We all are part of that body. We need each other. And the Bible is very clear that we need each other. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine says, two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one falls and the other one can reach, the other one can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. I shared with you a few weeks ago, my wife Jeannie took a fall and hit her head, had, su suffered a, a pretty serious concussion. Thankfully, there was a lot of people around. What if she would have fallen like that and no one was around? That could have been disastrous. Two are better than one. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. That just says we need each other. We need the presence of God in our lives. And sometimes we lose sight of, of that and we forget the, the, the value and the importance and the necessity of relationships. The reality is, is we need each other. There's people that are sitting next to you, you need them. That person that you met today, you may not know it, but some point in life, they may need you. You might need them. We need each other. We as pastors need you, we're a family, and the reality is we're better together. Listen, if you know information or you know something about somebody and you say, hey, so-and-so could use a contact from you, please let us know that. It is a, it's tragic, but a lot of people will sit and say, nobody's ever called me. Listen, if that's the case, call us. And please don't sit and wait. We may not know everything. And listen, I, I, 
when, when you look at the amount of people here and times that by three or five or whatever, it, it, I'm not, um, what do you call that when you know everything? Omniscient? I'm not at all. And even when you tell me things, sometimes I forget. So remind me, remind me, remind me. Let us know. We're a part of a team. And, and help us by, by encouraging us and saying, uh, hey, pastor, you might reach out to so-and-so. All of us as pastors, we value that. And, and by saying that doesn't mean that we're the ones that do the contacting because if we're a relational church, we all do that. Sometimes, sometimes we'll ask questions, that, hey, what about so-and-so? Have you heard anything about them? I, I haven't heard in a while. I mean, you know, any of us can pick up a phone and call rather than sit and wonder. And I think that's just part of being a relational church. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, all of you are together in Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. We're all a part of the body of Christ. This body has different parts, but they all form a body. You don't say, hey, I saw Jeff's eye today. You know his right eye? No, you saw me. And you saw my eyes at the same time. But we're all part of one body. We need each other, and we're in this together. Psalm 133 says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, in harmony. Listen, unity doesn't mean we're all thinking the same thing. Unity doesn't mean we all have to believe the same exact thing about everything. There's something that goes with unity that's harmony. And, and, this, and the choir number today was a, a case in point. They weren't all singing the same notes. They were singing the same, same words, but they were all singing different notes and it created a harmony that made that so impactful and so beautiful. So us living and dwelling in harmony. So quest, ask ourselves this question, what can we do to involve ourselves with the body, to get connected, to not just be a, a consumer, but to be a servant? Did you know that in, in the New Testament alone, there is over a hundred one another scriptures where the Bible speaks to this relational thing about un, one another. Love one another. A third of those 100 uh, one another scriptures deal with loving one another. That's something that's important for us to do, to honor one another, to prefer one another over ourselves, prefer one another with love, prefer one another in honor, saying, you matter, and I'm thinking about you before I think about myself, and I'm going to serve you before I serve myself. And really in relationships, if we can get that down, that's love, that's honor, that's, that's, uh, that's preferring one another. If we can get that element where we say, you know what, I'm, I'm making sure everybody else's needs are met, and when we give, the Bible says when we give, it, it comes right back to us, even greater than how, the measure that we give, right? That's not just about money. Actually, that, that scripture's not about money at all. Whatever measure you measure anything out with, it's gonna come back to you multiple times over. That's the nature, and that's how we ought to be with one another, living in harmony, accepting one another. Listen, look up these scriptures. It's easy to search on the internet. Just say, one another scriptures in the Bible. It's the greatest uh, Bible tool, the, the internet. It's a cool thing. Forgive one another. There's something that we, we, would, we would do well if we would just say, listen, I'm gonna live in forgiveness. I'm gonna forgive everybody. Be patient, show hospitality. Listen, our loving one another isn't just for us right here in this room. Our loving one another spreads out into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces. That's where we really put it to the test, where it's, it's, it's seen by everybody, where we can really make a difference. Listen, Satan loves, I said before, to, to see us disconnected, disinterested, and distracted, unplugged from the church body, isolated, unaccountable to other believers. When a person is in that place, they're defenseless. They're powerless against the enemy, and he knows that. And so as much as he can isolate us, man, he's winning the battle. We're better, better together. We need to be fully plugged in a relationship with Jesus and in a relationship with each other. Listen, church as usual is come shake hands, sing, sit, listen, and, and leave church that's not usual that's what i want us to be and continue to be where we truly know each other where we're committed to a relationship with jesus and we're committed to showing our love to others in very very practical ways second corinthians chapter one i want to read this and i want to invite the worship team to come it says this all praise to god the father of our lord jesus christ God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. What that verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, what those verses say is each of us is comforted by God through our struggles, through our trials, through our troubles, so that we can comfort others in their troubles. 
You see, the things that we go through, this is how God works everything together for good. We're going through a trial, we're going through trouble, and the reality is, is we might meet somebody down the road who's, who's gone through something very similar. And I can say to them, because going through that, God helped me. Going through that, God gave me comfort. And here's what I know. I may not know exactly what that person is going through, but I've got, a, I've got an idea. And I can come along and I, I've experienced comfort from God through that, and I can give comfort to somebody else. It's a story of a preacher who told of an unusual thing that happened in their church. They had an open mic prayer time. One Sunday, a man stood up and said, I need your prayers. I've been struggling with alcohol most of my life, and I've made the decision that I'm gonna quit. I've not had a drink for the past couple of weeks, but it's really, really getting tough. And there was a pause at the microphone for a little while, and then another man stood up and said, you know, I had the same problem. And I didn't think I could quit, but I did, and I haven't had a drink for five years. And another man stood and said something very similar, and then another. About three or four people stood up that day and confessed that they had struggled with this very same thing. And they all pledged to help the first man to overcome his habit. That's experiencing the comfort of Christ and giving that to somebody else. Listen to the message version of 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. All praise to the God and Father of our Master Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. That's relational. That's called relationship. That's called, God, you have a plan and a purpose and you can use me too.